Although I have taken many passive infrared detectors apart in the past and reverse engineered them, there's one type I have never to, I, I don't think I've reverse engineered one. It's the two terminal type that doesn't require a neutral. It literally goes in line with a light bulb and it can be used to actually control that light bulb. So let's start this video by sticking some wires into this and we'll power it up and we'll see how well it works. And I can get some timing off it as well, see what the time's set for. I don't know if you can change the timing inside this. We'll find out when we get inside. Well, I mean, obviously, you and me can change the timing because we can change the circuitry to suit usually. Here is the light I'm going to use to test it. It's an LED one. This will also show if it passes enough current to cause leakage. Uh, or in other words, just make the, the light glow dimly at night time. Because it must get some power from somewhere for its operation. Intriguing. So that's the two wires connected, just two wires, in and out. You wouldn't want to put live and neutral across this. I mean, unless you wanted to buy. Oh, it came with screws, by the way. I'll just pop those back over there. Let's bring up the tester. And then I'll precariously jam these wires into this, quite obviously, a speaker terminal. Completely non-compliant, but that's okay. It's not okay. You should use something much safer, etc. I'll plug it in. And the light is lit, and then went out again. Okay, it has a light sensor then. It has a light sensor, okay. So, um, right, I'm going to do a test on this, and I shall tell you how long it takes to turn on. But I'm going to turn the light off at the moment like this, and then I'm going to go out so that when I come back in again, you can see it does trigger. So I shall pause momentarily. Okay, I didn't really think that through too well, but now I have a cover over it. I pull the cover off, it detects my body, and of course uh, it's like, no, I have to cover it to so the light. Yeah, okay, anyway, it has been proven to work. I forgot about the light in the vicinity. Everything has gone wrong so far. Uh, right here, watch your eyes, the, the, most of the light is coming back. Right, I shall unplug it. For reference, it's has a 30 second time delay. It's very sensitive to ambient light. It won't come on until it is properly dark. It has a 30 second delay and also it re-triggers so that every time you it detects movement, even the light on, it will re-trigger that 30 second and start it again. Excellent. It works. That's the main thing. Also, there was no ghost glow and no measurable leakage current, so it's doing devious things. The power is off, incidentally, before I stuff this metal screwdriver in here. Right, I shall put these things out of the way. Resume the exploration. Does this come out the front? It's got the little, uh, the little cover. Does it come out the back? Hold on, sputter. Sputter. Oh, that's how it comes apart. And the circuit board ejects automatically. Excellent. It's not just a very standard passive infrared uh, unit just jammed in a hole. Excellent, that works well, the little lens. What do we have here? We've got the bridge rectifier, possibly a thyristor, lots of support circuitry, the chip that's probably doing everything, and a little power supply. I see what could be Zener diodes here. Right, tell you what, I shall take a picture of this, reverse engineer it, and then we can explore it. One moment, please. A few fizzy beverages later, reverse engineering is complete. Let's explore. I shall zoom down a little bit onto this. It's a fairly complicated circuit. This, it starts off as a, with a bridge rectifier. I thought this was going to be a thyristor, but it's actually a triac, and the triac is switched by a thyristor, and there's a 7.5 volt zener diode to cause a voltage threshold before the triac turns on, and that's how it keeps itself powered. There is also, when it's in the on state, it's got the extra feature that it diverts power via this diode to the power supply, but in the off state, where it's only drawing approximately 20 microamps of current, 
There is a very odd high voltage voltage regulator here that limits the current to quite a low level, has a very annoying transistor, 3D. Try searching for SOT23 3D transistor and you just get endless details about 3D models for this SOT23 for CAD design packages. But I did find it was. It's an MMBT A44 NPN 400 volt transistor. That generates a power supply with this Zener diode being used as a reference voltage to that transistor. There's a bit of filtering through a resistor to another capacitor and then it goes to the chip with a little uh, filtering capacitor again and the chip then generates its own regulated supply, that's the orange, uh, which powers the pass infrared detector and three potential dividers. The three potential dividers are uh, half these resistors here this resistor, this resistor, and the light sensor on the other side. We've got the pass infrared detector and the light sensor on the other side. And by changing these resistors, you can theoretically, or removing them completely, um, you can change the time delay and the sensitivity, and even the light sens sensitivity level, or just cut the LDR off if you just want it on all the time. What else is there worth saying? Not really much. Let's go straight to the... Uh, schematic, which I had to draw big because it's quite complex. Here is the big schematic. Here's the incoming bridge rectifier, interrupting the live to the load. Don't put live and neutral across this, it will instantly blow up. Let's just tame this down a bit because I think it's a bit ferocious. That's almost a bit too... Let's see what we can do about this. Yeah, uh, that'll do, actually. That's just fine. To turn the load on, the bridge rectifier has its positive and negative shunted by a track. I couldn't work out why they'd used a track. They could have used a thyristor, but it's possibly because it's just maybe a more robust switching component. When they want to turn the track on, the circuitry, the little chip here, actually turns on this very sensitive thyristor. And that thyristor then latches and uh, it will then provide power to the... Uh, the gate of this track via the Zener diode. So as the humpy AC supply, keep in mind it is rectified, it has to be up round about point, uh, 7.5 volts plus the uh, gate voltage of the track. So say about 8 or 9 volts perhaps. And uh, when the thyristor is turned on, the track will turn on at that point and that the fact it doesn't turn on at the exact zero crossing point is the reason that uh, it can actually drive a power supply for this circuitry. When it's off however the power supply is derived by this transistor acting as a voltage regulator. These super high value 2 times 20 meg ohm resistors adding up to should I brighten this up a bit just give, give me a second I'm going to brighten this up a bit that's better. Uh, so this transistor is acting as a voltage regulator and it's charging up this capacitor down here. And what happens is this resistor here, 470K, limits the current that it can charge that capacitor. And these two 20 meg ohm resistors uh, pass current to the base, but it's capped by another 7.5 volt Zener diode. And what that means is that the capacitor will charge up to roughly 0.6 volts above 7.5 volt Zener diode, which is about, say... It's going to be roughly 8-ish volts across here. But it's also worth mentioning that when the circuitry is active and when it's driving a small amount of current to this thyristor to turn on the track, at that point uh, it actually boosts the supply to this because it's not going to be getting it that all the time. If it was off... If this was open circuit, it would be continually trickling via this resistor and this regulator and keeping this capacitor topped up. But while it's turned on, what it does is that in the uh, time of the sine wave it takes to get up to that 7.5 plus the triax voltage, uh, the current is instead diverted via this diode to the capacitor directly. And when the triac does turn on, this thyristor isn't driving the gate of this track continually. As soon as the track turns on, it shunts this supply rail, so there won't be any current going into that capacitor. So it needs that zero crossing point. The current is being pumped directly over to that uh, capacitor to keep it topped up. 
uh, quite interesting. Basically, the power supply is derived in two different ways. One when the light is turned off and one when the light is turned on. It is very sophisticated and clever. There's a bit of filtering from this capacitor via this 1.5k resistor to this capacitor. I shall add a little extra dot up there like I should have added before. Then there's a little filter capacitor and then this chip itself. The chip itself creates a dedicated supply, a regulated supply. I think it's about 3.3 volts probably. And that powers the passive infrared detector. And there's filtering a 47k resistor to the zero volt rail the capacitor to filter the undulation that it detects, then a pull-down resistor, and that's how it detects it. But you can change sensitivity by one of these resistors. Now, the passive infrared detector, it has two detector chips in it that create a slight voltage based on long-wave infrared. That's the body heat passing by. But they're connected back to front, so that the ambient level of heat in a room doesn't it results in effectively a null voltage. This is why it has that dimply polythene lens or polyethylene lens in front of it, because that polyethylene lens effectively creates a hot spot as you walk across the room and it goes across one sensor first and then the other and that gives a push-pull effect and that creates a voltage differential. Inside this passive infrared detector is a MOSFET, a little tiny FET, and it is biased on very slightly with a resistor um, and that uh, voltage that generated by the differential uh, creates uh, a slightly higher gate voltage and it means it acts like a heat sensitive resistor, the, the value of goes up and down and that's what's passing through this capacitor and going to this unit. The regulated output also has its own little stability capacitor there. I shall add yet another dot. I've been missing out the dots. Too much liquor. Uh, and then there are three potential dividers go to, going between the zero volt rail, which I've put up there. I've curled right round just because it would have been quite a long circuit otherwise. And uh, and that regulated voltage. And one of those is the light sensor. It's the LDR, the light dependent resistor, cadmium sulfide type unit. And it's got a resistor they've chosen to get that specific value. You could change the value of that resistor. Or as I say, if you want it on all the time, you could just get a pair of snips and cut that off or black out the front of that. However, the other two dividers are for programming the sensitivity of the unit how the long range, the range it'll actually detect, and also the time delay. At the moment, the time delay is set for 30 seconds. To change that, you've got a resistor going to the uh, zero volt rail that you can either increase or decrease the value or indeed just leave it open circuit or fully short circuited. What it does is it looks at the voltage that's coming from these dividers and then uses it as far as I can see it's digital to set a time delay inside or a sensitivity level. Um, so I'm quite tempted to try and experiment with this. I'm tempted the time delay which is currently 30 seconds. I'm tempted to see what happens if I remove that resistor so it goes completely up to the positive rail here, the regulated rail, or shunt it out so it's down to the zero rail because it doesn't really indicate which direction it goes in the actual data sheet. Very, they're very, there's not much of a data sheet. Have I covered just about everything there is? Which is the bit that's going to fail in this? If a lamp, a traditional tungsten lamp goes pop, because this is not designed for huge loads, uh, if the traditional tungsten lamp goes pop, it usually takes out the track. If the track fails, it may also trick out that little thyristor. But to be honest, this came from... Uh, AliExpress and was ridiculously cheap, uh, like one pound thirty five, one dollar thirty five shipped. It's like ridiculous. It's just a mass produced item, I guess. The other thing that's going to fail here is people using impact drivers to tighten screws up and uh, breaking the solder joints here, which is something that could happen. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to do that experiment now, and then I'll tell you which way it went on the time delay. So I shall do that. Right now, one moment, please. Well, that was incredibly regrettable. That took much longer to do the test with inconclusive results than the whole reverse engineering of the entire circuit. I stuck a... Uh, well, initially, I removed the on-time resistor so that it basically pulled up to the positive rail via its standard pull-up resistor. And the time was one second. I thought, OK, so that's one extreme end. 
And then I bridged the two pads, so it was like tied to the negative rail. And the time was also one second, so not... Con I guess if it is doing something analog to digital inside, it might sort of roll over and that's using the extremes of its settings. Then I put a one meg ohm resistor across and uh, tested it and uh, then gave up after most of an hour. And then I put a 100k resistor across, it was 12 seconds. 200k, it was 30 seconds. 300k, 46 seconds. 500k, 3 minutes, 1 meg ohm. I gave up after 40 minutes. Uh, I really don't know. I do notice that the data sheet actually suggests putting a 100 nanofarad capacitor across the uh, sense input to ground for stability reasons. I wonder if that's kind of needed here for longer delays. So I can't really give you a decisive result. Even the data sheet is very vague about that. I'm not sure what the longest delay it can achieve is. Well, hours apparently, but not necessarily in a predictable manner. But that is a circuit. It's uh, interesting. It's uh, surprisingly deep and complex, particularly the way that when it's off, it derives a power supply in a slightly different way to when it's on. And that slight phase shift to actually allow it to power itself, uh, despite the fact that the load is on via two wires. Uh, but quite interesting. Uh, a cheap gimmicky device that I bought from AliExpress. I'll provide a link to it down below. Um, but uh, qu quite complex circuitry. And I mean, ultimately it does work. And I'm guessing that a lot of these two wire switching devices that basically go and series the load generate their own supply in more or less the same way. So it was well worth exploring for that purpose. But there we have it. It was interesting. It was fun to reverse engineer and quite interesting circuitry.